with me for being here. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is a whole sort of first I'll give you a bit of intuition about what networks are like, different types of networks and how to think about them. And I'll go through a whole bunch of different uh, you know, examples, some from my research, some from other people's research. And hopefully you get a sense of how to understand all the networks you have, how to exploit them, and, uh, and how to sort of make, uh, you know, make an impact using networks as well. Okay? Uh, hopefully, if the system in India is up, I'll also show you uh, some of the stuff we did for the RBI recently, so you can look at the picture of the Indian banking system and the risk of it real time. Uh, so, so that'll come at the end. Uh, you don't usually do a lot of this work alone. A lot of this work is with a whole bunch of different people. So some of them are there, and there's actually a few others who, who, are still, who I'm still working with, uh, but we haven't had any published work yet. Okay, so. Um, about 10 years ago, there was a very large conference on the mathematics and networks. And uh, since then, we have moved a lot within a decade. A lot of companies in the Bay Area, like Facebook, for example, have been critical in building tools, mathematics technologies for understanding networks. Uh, networks are very interesting simply because when you just look at them visually, you get a good sense of what they're like and what their properties might be. So what I'll try and do is actually give you a sense of a couple of these networks, uh, type, uh, type structures, and you'll get a sense of how to think about it as well. That's a picture of the internet, and it has this classic structure where there are hubs and there are a lot of small nodes, and plenty of stuff gets distributed very rapidly through these sort of central hubs. Many of you work in networks, you understand this quite well. Uh, the world is a small place, it's getting smaller and smaller. You've all heard of it's a small world. Uh, Eugene Stanley, who uh, many, many years ago did a famous experiment where he basically gave letters to people in Arkansas and said, get them to a stockbroker in Boston without telling them the address. And they said, whoever well, you think might know where this person is. And people kept mailing these letters out. Eventually, it got to him. He was sort of the stockbroker in Boston. And the average number of hops it took to get the letter from Arkansas all the way to Boston was six. And that's why we get this word, six degrees of separation. Uh, it's very easy in today's world to understand that that six degrees of separation is about three or four nowadays. Because if I have 50 friends on Facebook and each of them have 50 friends, you raise that to a power very quickly. It takes about four hours to get to the population of, of the universe as of now. And so we're really talking about a world now that's not six degrees of separation anymore. It's just basically three or four degrees of separation. Okay, so exploiting these networks is something that you might be interested in as business people. And hopefully you get some insights here you know, on how to do that. Uh, that's me inside Microsoft has a very nice piece of software for academics where you can look at your own network. So you get a whole bunch of people in there. Many of them from IAM actually connected to me as well. And uh, it's, uh, let me see if I can actually show you more of it. Did I get out of this now? picture and then you can sort of, Microsoft made this available, so you can actually look at, in fact, the picture is sort of a shrunk on the screen. So this basically shows you who all you're connected to, uh, and all they do is they take all your papers, you download everything, text mine it, and they can figure out who's connected to who through a list of publications. And you can also see who cites you, so for example, if you go to the citation graph, you'll get it turns out it's very easy to construct these things just off your Facebook data. And there are plenty of uh, tools my students do this on a regular basis, figure out how to look at networks of Facebook. Uh, it's very useful. Cities like San Jose, for example, who I work with, uh, we're trying to do things like take Facebook and figure out who are the 400 most important people in San Jose, so that if you have to get a message out, we kind of try and send it to those people. So I'll spend a little bit of time and tell you about how to do that as well, once we, once we get into it. Okay, that's the Ebola graph, and I'll skip that one. This is sort of an important picture. The two types of graphs I want you to focus on. There's one on the left. Okay, so in computer science, we call it a graph. The network is a graph, and many of you might have studied graph theory. So a graph is nothing but a function on nodes and connections. Okay, so that's the broad definition of a network. The one on the left is what we call a random network. So if I put down a bunch of nodes, let's say in this room, everybody here is a node, and I just randomly connect two people. 
and I do this a few times, and I see on average everybody's going to have about three connections. So some people have three, some people have two, some people have zero, some people have six. But generally speaking, the average is about three. That's a random network. On the right-hand side is what we call a scale-free network. A scale-free network is slightly different. There, some hubs have lots and lots of connections, and most people don't. Okay, that's pretty much what a social network looks like. People are connected in that fashion. There are a few people that are very, very popular and lots of friends. Most people have like one or two or three or four. If Facebook is different, we have a bunch of people on there. Most of them we don't necessarily connect with. The properties of these two networks are completely different. If you look at this picture, on the left is the road network in the US. On the right is the airline network in the US. The one on the left is a random graph, a random network. It has, roughly speaking, a distribution of nodes or connections where each node has some average level and some have more, some have less. On the right side, it's scale free. We have a hub and spoke network. There, some nodes have very high number of connections, most nodes have very few. So if you look at the distribution, it's not a nice normally distributed picture, it's really a distribution where you have sort of a declining or exponential in some form. Okay, those are power or distributions, and those two graphs are very, very different. If you're trying to understand the properties of these graphs and you want to get a message out, which one do you think is better? The one on the right is generally better because all I have to do is inform a few important people and this stuff gets distributed really quickly. Uh, in, in packet distribution, for example, that's what you want. In distributing information on financial networks, that's what you want. You want a scale-free graph. But you don't want that kind of network when you have a, a flu epidemic, you have an AIDS epidemic, you have financial contagion. That can be bad for you as well. Okay, so the scale-free graph has both good sides and a dark side as well. Um, HIV networks tend to be on the right side. Okay, they are scale free. They're usually people in HIV networks where some people have 50 sexual partners and most people have one or two. The way you fix that problem is you go and attack a few people that have a large number of partners. You want to get at the hub. Okay? Uh, flu networks are the same. When flu breaks out in our school systems, they are scale free in form. If you popular kids in school, all that happens is the popular kids get sick eventually because they're attracting everybody and then it spreads everything around. The way you fix that problem is the moment of the flu epidemic, you get the popular kids and send them home, give them a holiday, and, and, and everybody is better off than Okay? Uh, these are simple things that you do with scale-free networks. Random networks, actually, very few examples exist in the world. In fact, that road network is a very unusual example. So, when you look at the, the random network, it has a normal distribution of the number of connections each node has. On the right side, it's completely different. It's called a scale-free distribution because there's no average member of that population. Some people have very many connections, some people have very few. The average means nothing because there aren't too many people that look like the average. On the left-hand side, there are lots of people that look like the average. We spend all our time in classrooms, even at the schools we went to, learning the normal distribution. It turns out 95% of the phenomena in the world are not normally distributed. They're scale-free distributed. And yet we sort of teach people, you know, about the normal distribution. Okay? Very few things in the world are normally distributed. Ages, uh, I mean, sorry, heights of people, incomes are not uh, incomes are scale-free. Many people have very low income, very few people have very high income. Population in cities are scale-free. So it's about 95 to 97% of phenomena that on the right side and to ignore it. Okay, so I just want you to know that that we live in a world of, of, of scale-free networks where we have hub and spoke structure. Okay, this looks like a lot of math, but I'm just going to talk you through it. It's an important concept. Facebook uses this a lot. Okay? If I give you a network of people, and I just show you the picture, and I say, tell me who the most important person in the network is. Okay, can you tell me who that is? And that's important because it allows you to sort of target marketing at people, it allows you to do all sorts of other things effectively. It's a very simple concept. In fact, Larry Page at Google used this concept to come up with the, the model behind the search engine. That's why it's called PageRank. But he didn't do it first. Phil so Bonasich at UCLA did that in 1987. He was a sociologist. He was looking at schoolboy networks. And basically, my influence in a network is a function of how influential I am and who I'm connected to. So I might be somebody who has a lot of influence but very few connections. Let's have a lot of power in the network. Or I might be somebody with very little influence, but I'm connected to a lot of people with influence, and so I get my influence. So the whole thing is sort of recursive. Everybody's influence is a function of who they're connected to and who their influence is. And so I can represent the network as a matrix where if I'm one row in the matrix, everybody I'm connected to is on the columns, I get to know in each cell what my connection is to everybody else, how many times they interact. That's what Facebook does. They figure out how many times two people have likes and comments and shares and all that stuff between them. 
it becomes a number inside that matrix. So that's why I title this talk inside the matrix. We call it an adjacency matrix. And if I do a, a mathematical operation on that, which is get the principal ideal vector of this matrix, it basically tells me in the main dimension of influence in this matrix how much my weight in that dimension is. Okay? It's very simple to do. It's one line of program code. And those are three examples. The, the network in the middle, everybody's equal, I get equal scores, and so on. This is called centrality. Okay, what Larry Page did in his, in his PhD dissertation was, he basically looked at every web page and said, how many pages refer to this page, and how many pages does this page hyperlink to? That gives you sort of a network of web pages. You can mine that network using this one line of code and say, okay, which is the most important page in this group? So whenever you issue a search instruction to Google, it pulls up a whole bunch of pages, and then for the relevant pages, it looks at their position in the network of pages and gives you the most important, the most central page first. When I take this analogy to India, for example, <coughs> we construct the network of banks, and then we have to ask which bank is the most central. And if that bank is affected, it's going to bring down the banking system. We've done that for the US, we've done that for Canada, and we've done that for India. I'm going to show you the thing live in India. India is the only country right now where we do this live. We figure out who is the most important bank in the Indian banking system every day. And we can look at that. Okay, so Raghu Raghu, for example, can look at this picture in real time and take a look at it. So that's the concept of centrality. And that's one calculation we do on, on networks to actually come up with. Right. The second thing you want to worry about a network is, what's the diameter? If I'm going from one node in the network to another node in the network, and I compute all the pairwise distances hopping through the network, I can find out the shortest distances from each node to every other node. And if I take the maximum across all those, that's what we call the diameter. In some sense, it tells you how tight the network is, how quickly can I go from my position in the room to some other position in the room, and what's the maximum of that. If you're worried about contagion, you want a network with a big diameter. If the diameter is very tight, that means everything's going to proliferate and spread. Okay, so that's, in marketing, you want tight diameter. You want to be able to spread a message really quickly, and so the, the, the smaller diameter is the better. That picture there is hard to notice, but actually, if you look at that thing, it has a diameter of 2. It doesn't seem to have a diameter of 2, but it can be deceptively, uh, you know, the, the, the visual thing can be deceptive, and that actually is just a diameter 2. Okay, so we compute diameter, that's another thing. We also compute fragility. Fragility is an interesting number on a network because you want to ask yourself that if there's disease in some local part of the network or some bank in, in a financial network is in trouble, how quickly will that disease spread through the network? Will it die out locally in a local region of the network or will it become a general global phenomenon on the network? It's pretty easy to compute that and there's a score that we compute or R, and if that R is bigger than 2, then it's going to have spread. If it's less than equal to 2, then it kind of dies out. So we tend to compute fragility, and it's meaningless right now to you, but when I show you the numbers for the US banking system before the crisis, you'll be surprised to see what that number was when we computed it to figure out if the system was fragile or not. Okay, weak ties. Weak ties are ties two or three hops down in the network. Okay, so. Granovator, in 1973, without Facebook, without even understanding or seeing networks or being able to characterize them in software, had a very interesting hypothesis. He said, your influence in a network or the benefits you get out of a network are not a function of who you know. It's a function of who you know two or three hops down the channel. And he wrote on a very elegant theory in this paper, and it's something that I think we are kind of intuitively aware of, but we don't really have proof of it. In the last four or five years, because Facebook and LinkedIn data has become available, we've been actually able to test this theory. And it turns out, you don't get a job because of your immediate friends. You get a job actually because of your friends two or three nodes down the network. So if you're looking for a job, don't ask your friend for a job. Okay, ask your friend to put you in touch with other people further down the network to get a job. Lots of PhD students are now studying this. They're kind of doing their PhD thesis on LinkedIn data and Facebook data and, and sort of confirming the hypothesis from you know, more than 30, 40 years back. So that's weak ties. And finally, communities. It's another calculation we do on a network. We try and take an entire network of people, and we try and look for clusters of people that work in communities. And what, what do we mean by a community? It's a group of nodes in the network where people tend to interact much more within that group rather than outside that group. Okay, Facebook, Amazon, Yahoo, everybody is computing groups and communities on the entire social graph that they have. They compute that and then try and figure out 
who in the community is most central. So then they compute the centrality score and try and come up with that. And then we have targeted advertising. Okay, so we have this thing called advert targeting, where we actually send the thing to the most central person within the community in the network. This is a hard computational problem, but we've got a lot of cool algorithms now that solve these problems quite effectively. If I get time, I'll show you. I've taken 30 years of venture capital data, all the VC that have worked together in funding individual startups and constructed graphs, a network graphs of these VCs and how they work in communities. It turns out, research now shows that VCs that work in communities, there's some VCs who tend to work with the same group repeatedly, versus VCs who tend to work, you know, one-off on different things. People who work in communities are like a good soccer team that plays together and becomes really good at, at working together. Their startups tend to perform better than the startups that are funded by VCs that are not sitting in some community structure. Okay? So we have a lot of sort of intuitive insights from uh, from graph theory, which we've sort of applied to, uh, uh, to sort of various situations. So the first example I'll show you is what we call systemic analysis. We try to understand the system. The first thing you want to do is understand the network that that system has. And I'll show you some work I did with IBM Labs down in Alberta here, where we actually took the entire US banking system and how banks lend to each other, constructed a network graph, and then for five years before and after the crisis, we're going to show you what that network looks like and give you some insights from this one. Okay, so, so it's called the Midas Project. This is a project out of IBM. Um, there's a whole team that I worked with at IBM there that, that did this work. And uh, just to cut to the chase, what we have is a data model that looks like this. There are a lot of filings that every financial institution has to make. Every time the director changes, they decide to trade, they make a loan, uh, they issue a security, they have to report this to the SEC and the FDIC. All these are public documents. So they are basically posted up on the SEC servers. You or anybody else in the world can download this and take a look at the entire transaction. So what we do is like what Google does. Any time there's a filing, we basically just pull it out, we text mine it, and we tag it and we put it into different buckets and so on and so forth. The specific application I'll show you is loans, banks lending to each other. When they lend to each other, they basically post a file of about 150 pages, either in Word or PDF format. It's completely non-standard because we haven't standardized anything yet. It's not even XPRL, XML, or anything of that sort. And uh, we download it, we text mine it, and pull out all the relevant details from it, and we actually construct an entire database of all the flows between banks lending to each other. So we have a network of lending flows, and then we want to see which bank is the most critical in the system. So this is what a picture of that looks like. There's a loan from Citibank and 12 other banks to Schwab, about $800 million. We read through the entire loan document, and we catalog how much flow there was between each bank. We do that for every loan that was made and filed in the SEC. When we plot the network, that's what it looks like. This is the first time we actually got a view of what the lending network between banks in the US looks like. Very interesting picture. There are three clusters of banks, and within those three clusters, there are three banks that sit in the middle, Citigroup, JP Morgan, and Bank of America. Okay, so we looked at that. This is in 2005. And it gives you some idea of the fact that there's concentration. If one of those three major banks goes down and dislocates the network, it may not completely harm the network because the three clusters will then autonomously be separate from each other but might still be functioning. Uh, but we're also curious whether the network can compute centrality, who's the most important bank relatively to all the others, well, how fragile this network is, what the diameter of this network is, all those things I mentioned earlier. So I'll show you what those numbers look like. Uh, in 2006, you can see the network is sort of similar, but it's getting tighter. In 2007, in the heart of the crisis, everything is one big bundle, so it's sort of extremely risky. In 2008, after sort of trouble has happened and banks have stopped lending to each other, the network gets sparse again. In 2009, again, it's spreading out. Okay, so we sort of see this flow uh, through the crisis. And the government actually been looking at these pictures and trying to get a sense of where we can kind of monitor things from. So the numbers are important. I don't know if you can see everything, but in 2005, if I asked you to guess what the fragility was, I told you bigger than two is fragile. In 2005, it's 137. It's extremely fragile, okay, the, the banking uh, loan network. And then it drops down to, till we end up in 2009, where it's still 35. Okay, so we live in a fragile interbank system in the US, and I don't think a lot of things that we might want to do will actually fix this. The list of banks in order of importance to the entire system uh, JP Morgan is on top, we've normalized it, so it's one. Uh, Bank of America is at 0.92, and then Citigroup is way down at 0.64. Okay, 
Okay, so the interpretation of that is Citibank is contributing about 64% to systemic risk as much as JP Morgan is contributing. Okay, so this is a list of banks that the government can then use to say you guys are systemically important, and under Dodd Frank laws, we basically charge them an extra 1% of capital. The FDIC, who I work with, actually uses a list like this to figure out how to allocate their budgetary resources to supervising each of these different banks in the system as well. Okay, and remember, all this is coming out of a network. Model. Okay, so these network models are offering us lots of nice ways of, of getting at various things. Okay, so there's one problem with these networks that I just showed you, and that is we are only exploiting how each one is connected to the other. We don't have a measure for how diseased each bank actually is. So we want to also put a score on each node saying if this bank is less healthy than the other bank, how does it change the system? The second thing we want to do is we want to ask can I get one number for the entire financial system that I can track every day? Like Homeland Security says red, orange, you know, green, or whatever it is. Can we have a number for the system-wide risk of the banking system that we can plug in and watch? And if it suddenly jumps, can we find out which bank caused it, what was the reason for it, and so on? So we extended this model. So this is a recent sort of research article that came, I wrote just a few months ago. And this is what we've implemented actually in India right now. So, to skip all the math, E is just a matrix that has all the connections without putting any health numbers on it. And then C is the compromise vector. It just says what's your credit rating and how healthy the bank is. And we can put that all together. We compute that one number, S, which is the square root of this matrix calculation. Okay? But the nice thing about that S is it allows us to do a lot of nice mathematics. So here's an example. We basically have banks with value 0, 1, and 2. 0 is very healthy, 1 is medium healthy, and 2 is not healthy. And then that's the network. We can represent it as a matrix like this. And then we can compute various things. So the, so the total centrality of each bank is plotted. So we have it by bank. I can compute the fragility for the system. I can compute the amount of risk each bank contributes to the whole system. So the total is 11.62 for the system right now. And this is the list of various banks and how much they contribute. So the government knows exactly how much each bank is contributing to the entire list of the system. I can also ask if a bank drops in quality by one notch in its credit quality, how much impact does it have on the system-wide risk? So that's something we can monitor. And all this is what we've actually implemented right now uh, back, in, back in India. Criticality is a product of how central you are and how risky you are. So it so, sort of tells you both things. And we also check to see if one bank starts behaving badly, does it cause other people in the system to have trouble? That's called risk scaling. And it turns out the model is pretty good because no one bank behaving badly can cause sort of spillover effects on the other banks and they can keep more capital. Okay, let me just try and bring up the thing from India and see if that will be a little bit more decided for it. So, uh, this, I, this is in the browser, I don't know if you can. Yeah. Function F11? Yeah, I don't know if this will... Okay. I actually want to go to the right. Because... Oh, yeah. Okay. Great. Okay, so let me just show you. This is actually running on a server in India right now. Uh, we, we sort of took this model and we... With the RBI, we want to look at all the banks. So we have a way of scoring the banks, computing the network, for all the banks. And uh, a company in India did this. Uh, in fact, it's Suhas from the bank. Is Suhas there? Yeah. yeah, so his group. So, in fact, we didn't do this inside the RBI. We did just do it outside. It was very quick. We've tried to implement this in the US for the last three years. It hasn't been possible to work with the bureaucracy to get it done. And the whole office of financial research do this. In, uh, it took us about three months to do this in India. <laughs> so, uh, so that's sort of the, this the red bones thing. It's still sort of, we're still building out the GUI and stuff. But you get in here, you type in here and you say what kind of financial institutions you want to look, look at. So I just pick banks. Let's just take only the banks. Then once you select the banks, it gives a list of the banks. So we'll just say, pick all of them. Then I'll just pick, I want all the measures to be computed, which I just talked about. And then you can pick a date. So let's just say tax date, maybe April 15th. And I'll submit. It takes about 30 seconds. It's going to pull all the data for all these banks that is at the warehouse and then compute it. So hopefully it's doing it. Yeah, it's waiting up there. 
And once it's done, it'll give you the fresh plot for the system. Okay, so that's actually coming all the way from India. And then I can go and mouse over this thing. So let me do that for you. That's the network. And there are two things here. You see on the left it says degree in, degree out. What we have is a network, and the network is really doing a whole bunch of computations, say which bank affects another bank, and by how much. And the size of the circles is the number of connections a bank has. So yes bank, for example, up there, blue, is got the most connections with it influences or is influenced by, by other banks in the system. Okay? I don't have time to tell you how we come up with this measure of influence, but there's a whole bunch of technology from, uh, from a lot of researchers here. Now, if I mouse over Yes Bank, it shows me who Yes Bank is affecting. So if Yes Bank gets in trouble, which are the first sets of banks that are going to be affected because they have sort of a connection to them. Okay, so we get that. And you can see Yes Bank is affecting everybody. Okay, there's no red, it's all blue, so they're all, they're sort of a big driver of, of systemic risk in India. If I go to IDBI over here, IDBI has, for example, is affecting all the ones in blue and is being affected by the ones in red. Uh, if I go here, very interesting result, where is State Bank? State Bank doesn't affect anybody. <laughs> and it's the biggest bank, right, in, in the country. And the fact is, State Bank actually does everything internally. It doesn't really operate with everybody else very much. And so that's a good thing in India, right? Because the biggest bank is actually sort of insulated from uh, everything else that you might have. Okay? Uh, you can basically look at the breakout of this risk. So let me just break it out. So I told you that that total system-wide risk score at the top is 17.35 right now as of April 15. The frigidity is 7.46. So the Indian banking system is much lower frigidity than the US. The US is operating at somewhere between 20 and 30. And we are at, at 7. So we are actually less fragile in India than, than the United States. And if you look at that list there, the total of 17.35, I have the exact contribution from each bank. So if I mouse over these guys here, Yes Bank contributes 2 out of that 17. Okay. So if we said, because of this systemic risk, we're going to impose a slightly higher tax or require banks to keep more capital. Our model actually tells the government exactly how much each bank is sort of responsible for. Okay? So that's the risk decomposition. If you go further down, this is risk increment. This is again, yes, bank is the most risky. Uh, it says that if your credit rating drops one notch, how much will you contribute? That means that's 1.07. So that's 17 of systemic system at risk will go up by 1.03 if a yes bank drops one credit, one credit notch. Centrality, who's the most central? That's Karur Vaishya Bank. This is the one that's in the middle, connected to everybody. Okay? So centrality, like I told you, is who's the most important person, ignoring the, the level of disease at each node, but just in the network. So Facebook computes this, they want to know it. You could be central because you have a lot of connections, or you could be central because you're connected to somebody with a lot of connections. So if I have only three friends, but one of them is Bill Clinton, I can be very central, okay, simply because I derive the truth. So, so Karur is here, there are a lot of others, and then Yes Bank shows up a little later. So Yes Bank is causing a bigger impact, not because it's central, but because it actually has a lower credit rating than some of the other banks. Okay, so we, we understand what that is. And then criticality. Finally, I'll just show you one more thing. This is the plot. We went back and did this from 2008. We actually constructed the network every day from 2008 back. That's the plot. The blue line is the plot of systemic risk over time. How the Indian banking system has had system-wide risk. And you can actually mouse over and look at it. And right now we are pretty much at the average of what it usually is over the last six, seven years. Okay? Okay, so that's just a quick, uh, I just want to show you a demo of this. Function F11. Go back to... I don't know, how much time do I have? Five? Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll, I was just going to show you the uh, venture capital network, but I'll, I'll skip that. Just let me take it. You want to skip it? Okay. <laughs> I don't have pictures of the network though. I should have brought pictures of the network. But, so, so, so we took 30 years of data actually, you know, for all. So we basically got data on every startup, every financing round, and I know 
If in a financing round, three VCs did it together, I form, I give each of them a connect, one connection each. And I do this sort of over time, so I know what the network of VCs looks like. We ran that communities algorithm to find out which VCs are in communities, which VCs are not in communities. And then we looked at to see whether, we had, basically the goal was very simple. We wanted to see whether a VC that's very important, like Pino Perkins, is going to do well for a startup, or it's a group that plays well. So it's like if you take World Cup soccer, World Cup cricket, does a team that wins have one star player, or is it a team that doesn't have a star player, but they, work, they really play together a lot, and so they practice a lot together. So we did that, and we basically you know, sort of cataloged all the, all the VCs as one type or the other, and I'll just show you one table. The top variable there is community, and we try to see if you have more community VCs funding a startup, Will it go to exit faster? Will it have better multiples, a better return, uh, and so on and so forth? So there are various different things. The stars against them means that variable is significant, explaining better performance of the startup. So the community variable is highly significant. The centrality variable, which is sort of halfway down the list, in previous research was actually highly significant. That is, if you had a star VC funding your startup, your, your startup was likely better than a startup that did have a star VC. But after you account for the community effect, that variable goes away. The result basically is if you want to get funded, you want to be funded by a group of VCs that have often worked together a lot before in the past, and that on average does better for your startup than get funded by one star VC. So the choice between say five VCs that have been working together a lot and you've got Trino Perkins alone, do the one with five, you know, rather than so this is sort of the insight from, from this paper. Alright, so I'll, I'll just stop there. I don't want to keep on going with this and maybe there are questions about this.